Rancher is now joining the Hyperconverged Infrastructure Club with their latest product, Harvester, that's designed to help bridge the gap between HCI software and the cloud-native ecosystem. You may not have heard of Harvester, but it's another product by SUSE Rancher, just like Rancher itself, K3S, Longhorn, and many other products in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Harvester is Kubernetes at its core, but it's hyper-converged infrastructure that actually helps you build and run virtual machines. Wait, virtual machines on Kubernetes? Yes, virtual machines in Kubernetes. It uses Kubernetes at its core to provide orchestration. It includes KVM as its virtualization platform, and then it runs KubeVirt to take care of the virtualization management layer that orchestrates the running of virtual machines inside of Kubernetes. It uses Longhorn to provide a persistent storage layer and many other open source cloud native technologies. It's designed to run on bare metal and spinning up one or more nodes gives you a cluster, which then you can spin up virtual machines which then you can spin up Kubernetes on top of those virtual machines. But it's not just for Kubernetes. You can run any virtual machine here because it runs on top of KVM. So how does it all work? It's pretty simple, actually, a lot simpler than I thought it would be. We're going to create a Harvester cluster with one node that can be expanded easily later. We're going to create a Windows and Linux virtual machine. We're going to create networking and even VLANs for our VMs. We'll explore monitoring and metrics with Grafana that ship with Harvester. We'll then add Harvester to our existing Rancher cluster, giving us a single pane to manage both Kubernetes clusters and our virtual machine clusters. And then we'll go all out and let Harvester spin up a high availability K3S cluster with that CD for us automatically, which then we'll have Harvester, which runs Kubernetes, which then will be running virtual machines, which then will be running Kubernetes on top of that. At some point, this is gonna become sentient anyway. To create your Harvester cluster, it's pretty easy. You'll need a machine that meets some pretty low specs, but then you'll need to download the ISO, install Harvester, and boot for the first time. Keep in mind that Harvester should be treated like an appliance. There's nothing to manage because everything comes with the OS, and updates come from Rancher themselves. So you'll walk through some typical setup steps, and after the first boot, you'll have to wait until it says it's ready. Now, a side note, I ended up adding an additional NIC to my machine. Now, you can run this with only one NIC, but then that NIC will be sharing both management and networking for your whole entire cluster. So it's best to add another NIC if you can. But if you don't have one, you don't need one. But once it's ready, it'll actually show you the VIP on the screen. So we get a virtual IP, and that's because these are clustered. And then visit the URL for your VIP. You'll need to set a password and then you can log in. So once you get signed in, you'll be greeted with this dashboard here. And you can see I have a few things set up already just so you can see some data on the dashboard. But if you're new to Harvester, the first thing you wanna do obviously is create virtual machines. But in order to install virtual machines, we need some images. Now you can upload images or ISOs from here and you can either provide a URL to the image or you could do a file upload. As you can see, I already uploaded the Ubuntu minimal image the Ubuntu full server image, and a Windows 10 image. Next is something optional, but something I wanted to do was create an actual network for these virtual machines. Now, as you can see, I set up a VLAN for these virtual machines and named it Untrusted. And this network has a VLAN tag of 30, and it's my Untrusted network. Now, I did this because I want to run some of my virtual machine in bridge mode, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But out of the box, virtual machines will run in masquerade mode, which is actually an internal Kubernetes network, similar to other virtualization platforms that you see if you have an internal network for those devices, but this is Kubernetes specific. So anyways, if you're just testing this out, you don't need one, but eventually you might wanna connect these virtual machines to the physical network that they're on. And so I did it this way with a VLAN. Next, when you're ready to create a virtual machine, it's actually really straightforward and easy. You can see I have some set up here already, but you would create your virtual machine. You would name your virtual machine Ubuntu 2. <laughs> you would set up some of the basics. So how many CPUs do I wanna give it? How much memory do I wanna give it in gigs? And then you can set up an SSH key for it to be able to SSH into this machine. Now, I only recommend doing that if you want to SSH into these machines, but we have a web view and even a serial console that we can connect to once we get going. Next, you'll wanna define your volumes on this machine. And if we're installing it for the first time, most likely we're gonna to need to add two volumes or two devices. So the first one's going to be a CD-ROM to this image. We'll go with the Ubuntu Live server. Set a disk size, it really doesn't matter for this CD-ROM, and set the bus type. For CD-ROMs, I set it to SATA. Then we'll add another volume for our disk. We'll keep the disk type as disk. Then we'll set the size of the disk, and then we'll set the bus type. 
Now you can set it to SCSI or some other device type if you want, but I'm gonna lean into Vert.io and their drivers. Next, you'll set your networking. And so out of the box, it's set to default in the management network. This is what I was talking about earlier, how I have two NICs in my machine. One is dedicated to management and another is dedicated to all the network traffic for my virtual machines. And here we'll see the network that we set up earlier, our VLAN, untrusted. And for model, this is the model of that virtual NIC. These are the KVM options that we're used to seeing. I'm gonna keep mine to vert.io. And then for a type, I'm gonna set it to bridge. Now, SRIOV, I think is for pass-through. I'm actually not gonna set that, but that's super interesting. But I'm gonna keep mine to bridge. Node scheduling, pretty awesome. So this is how you get high availability virtual machines. You can set it to run on any available node. Now, I only have one node here, but if we had multiple nodes, you would wanna keep this. Run only on specific nodes. So if I had two nodes and I only wanted to run on node two, I would select it here. Or run VM on nodes matching scheduling rules. I didn't set up any scheduling rules, but these are selectors and I assume this is selectors just like they are in Kubernetes. So you set some labels on a node, you select that node, and then this virtual machine will run on that based on a label. Pretty cool stuff. Now I'm gonna set mine to run on any available node. I only have one, but if I expand in the future, I wanna make sure that this is set. Also, another call out is that if you don't have this set, live migration support is not enabled. So there's some really cool stuff here with scheduling and live migration of nodes when you're taking things down and shutting things down gracefully and spinning them up on other nodes uh, that you might want. So you might want to keep it on any available node. Then we have machine type. They recommend keeping it to none. Um, I've always set mine to Q35, but none should work just fine. And this again is a KVM option. And then we have YAML templates for both user data and network data. This is pretty advanced. I haven't played with this all this much. But this is actually setting up our cloud config right here. So this is saying, hey, when you boot up for the first time, make sure that QEMU guest agent is installed. And then we're gonna run system CTL enable now, and we're gonna enable the guest agent. So pretty cool. And if we would have specified an SSH key, it would have added it to this. So this is basically our cloud config. Super cool, super cool. So anyways, that's a lot about this virtual machine. So let's just click the create button. So once we create this virtual machine, it's going to actually spin this up, image the machine, apply the user data settings that we had set that are default, so you don't need to do anything there. And then we should be able to remote into this machine. So if we open in WebVNC, we can see that this machine is up and running and ready to be installed. If we would have filled out our cloud init, we wouldn't have to do any of this, but you get the picture here. We can manually install this like we normally would do. And then once the machine's up and running, we can actually connect to a serial console. And since it's not up and running, it's still being installed, we can't connect right now, but I'll show you how that works here. So let's stop that virtual machine and let's start this one. I already have this one baking in the oven and it's all ready to go, <laughs> like on cooking shows, whatever. But if we open up the web console here, we can see that this is a normal Ubuntu machine booting up and we can log in if we like. And then if we connect to the serial console, we'll connect to the serial console. Okay, so there's a Linux machine, pretty straightforward, and it seems just like any other virtualization platform that's out there. Next is a Windows machine, and I'll show you how this works rather than creating it, because I already created one. If you're installing one for the first time, you should look at their instructions because there's actually a few things you need to do, but this is the same on any KVM installation you actually need to mount the driver disk for all this virtual hardware, which if you've done this on any other KVM installation, it's just the same. But it's actually super cool because they use a Docker container for the driver disk to mount to this virtual machine that's running in Kubernetes. Sounds super complicated, but it's actually very easy. It's like four clicks, and I'll leave a link in the description to their documentation on how to do that. But the same goes for this Windows machine. Once it's up and running, you can click start. Then we can open the web VNC console, we can see this machine booting up and then we can remote into this machine. Now doing this through WebVNC will get you by, but most likely you're gonna wanna run RDP if you're on Windows and SSH if you're on Linux or Ramina or anything else other than WebVNC. But you can see this is a virtual machine that's running inside of Harvester, which is what we talked about, which is actually Kubernetes and then running a virtual machine inside of that. But really awesome that we can spin these up really easily. So another cool thing about Harvester is we actually get monitoring and metrics for Grafana out of the box. If we go back to the dashboard, we could see we have cluster metrics. So this is for our whole entire cluster. We have a node of one, but we could see that across multiple nodes if we had them. We could see the summary level. Then we could see virtual machine metrics. 
So metrics on these virtual machines, storage, network, transmission, how many packets are being transmitted. But the really cool thing is that we can actually pop out to Grafana. They include Grafana with it and dashboards already. So really awesome, really awesome. And we can actually switch between these dashboards. They're already pre-configured for us. So if we wanna see how Core DNS is doing, <laughs> which again is kind of weird that we have Core DNS running inside of our hypervisor, because Core DNS usually supplies DNS to Kubernetes. But if you wanna check on Core DNS, you totally can. If you wanna check on all your nodes, you can. You can zoom in, adjust time ranges. And then you could even just have a home dashboard to see everything that's going on. So CPU utilization right now, memory utilization right now, disk utilization. So really cool, lots of dashboards and lots of cool stuff that comes out of the box. And super awesome because they're using yet another open source product on top of their stack and not just a one-off of something else. Really cool, really cool. So at some point after you have your virtual machines running, you'll probably wanna back them up. It's actually super easy and straightforward with Harvester. First, we'll need to configure our backup targets and that's actually in settings. Now with backup targets, we actually have two targets we can target. <laughs> we can target NFS for a Unix file system, or we can target S3. And we do that within settings, and then we go to backup target and edit settings. Now I've already set up NFS and it's as simple as giving it an NFS path, but you could also change it and target S3. So if you're not familiar with S3, it's object storage, made popular by AWS and a lot of other people, but it's object storage instead of block storage or file storage on a path. And if you're running AWS S3 or Google Cloud has object storage, or even an open source product like MinIO, you could back up your virtual machines with S3. But I set mine up with NFS because it's easy and it's here. <laughs> so once you have that set up, backing up a virtual machine is as simple as clicking on the machine and clicking take backup. And then after you start backing up those machines, you'll see those inside of backups. Okay, so all of that aside, this is where the real fun begins if you're running Rancher already. So you can add Harvester to your Rancher installation, giving you a single pane of glass to manage both your virtual machines and your Kubernetes cluster. And it also gives you some additional options too. So if you're running Rancher, it's as easy as going into the hamburger menu and then virtualization management. Once you land here, it'll tell you that, hey, you know, Harvester is a thing, it exists and you should add it. So to add it, we import existing. Next, we're gonna name this cluster and it can be anything really. I'm naming mine Harvester Cluster 01 and let's click create. Then it'll give you a webhook URL that you'll wanna copy and save it. And also this is a secret, you shouldn't be able to see mine right now. Not that it even matters or anyone could even reach this, uh, but treat this webhook, this URL like a secret. So copy it to your clipboard. Then you'll wanna go back to Harvester and into settings. Then you'll wanna find your cluster registration URL and you'll wanna edit that. And then you'll wanna paste that value inside of the value. Once you do that, that's gonna start importing Harvester on your Rancher cluster. So back in Rancher, we can see it already started importing this cluster and it's already done. So don't worry, it's not gonna do anything to your existing hardware or do anything to your existing cluster. But what it is doing is giving you Harvester inside of Rancher along with any RBAC or permissions or controls that you already set up. So now we don't need to use authentication and even go directly to that Harvester VIP. We can get there through Rancher. So how do we do that? Now, if we go to virtualization management, we can actually see our cluster here and we can manage it the same way that we were just doing through Harvester itself. But we're doing it here through Rancher. So single plane of glass. Pretty cool, but it doesn't stop there. The coolness does not stop there. We're not even close yet. So let's go into virtual machines and let's actually shut those virtual machines down. We wanna do something more cool than just run plain old virtual machines. Uh, don't get me wrong, pretty cool, but we wanna do a little automation and my specs on that machine aren't the greatest. So let's shut those down. And remember, I promised that we were gonna spin up a high availability K3S cluster on etcd through Harvester and it's super, awesome and super easy to do. I kind of went crazy with this last night. I'll show you where I went crazy and how you could kind of go crazy too. Okay, so I trust that that's gonna shut down, but let's go back into our cluster management. And you can see here, I have two clusters. So local obviously, or maybe not so obviously, is just for Rancher. 
It's a dedicated management cluster just for Rancher. And then cluster 01 is my downstream cluster that was provisioned by Rancher where all of my containers and all of my user workloads run. But let's create yet another cluster. Let's just create one. Let's click create. And now you see we have some new options. So cool, so cool. Sorry, I'm super excited about this. Um, we have some new options here. You can see we have Harvester here as a target. So most of this you see here isn't new with Harvester. We could always create clusters and target Azure, Google, Amazon, Linode, or VMware. But now we have this option to target Harvester as well. So we can actually target that virtual machine cluster as if it's a cloud provider. It's kind of what it is. And spin up a Kubernetes cluster just by clicking a few buttons. So I'm super excited. I almost forgot we need to set up our cloud credentials. I mentioned it's a cloud provider, but we didn't set up our cloud credentials yet. Super easy. So if we go into cloud credentials, we'll need to create some. And we'll need to say that these credentials are for Harvester. So I'm gonna name mine Harvester Cloud. You can name it anything you'd like. And then you'll wanna choose the Harvester cluster there. Should be the only one there. Then we'll click Create. So these are credentials that Rancher will use and provide to Harvester to orchestrate and authenticate with that cluster. And since we imported that cluster, there isn't much for us to do other than to create this credential and say to use that. Pretty easy. So let's go back and now let's create a new cluster. So now we have a choice between RKE1 and RKE2 and K3S. So RKE1 is the Kubernetes we know from Rancher that we run on top of Rancher. And K3S is yet another distribution of Kubernetes that we're familiar with. But RKE2 is a little bit different and it's titled the government distribution. And that's because they're targeting the government with this release because it adheres to a lot of their security guidelines. So super cool, I'm a fan of that, but I actually am a big fan of K3S too. So let's actually pick that. So let's pick Harvester. Now we're gonna create this cluster. Before we do anything, let's scroll down here and set the Kubernetes version. Remember I said we wanted K3S. So here in the Kubernetes version, you can see we have RKE2, Experimental, and then the release of RKE2, and then we have K3S, Experimental, and then the current release of K3S. And then on top of that, this whole deployment mechanism is also experimental, but it works fine. So I'm actually gonna choose the experimental version of K3S on top of the experimental node driver of Harvester. Totally fine. So now that we have that out of the way, let's name this. So I'm gonna name mine K3S home. Next, we'll need to set up some machine pools. So machine pools are just groups of nodes, groups of virtual machines. I only want one pool. If you wanted more than one pool, you could set them up here, but I'm gonna keep it simple and say one pool of machines. And how many machines do I want in there? Well, right now it says one machine. And if we look over here at CD, he's, he's not happy. <laughs> he's saying a cluster with only one etcd node is not fault tolerant. And we know that. We need more than one node of all of these things to be fault tolerant. And same with control plane, same with worker. So let's up the machine count to two. Well, etcd's not so happy anymore. We can see control plane's happy because now he's fault tolerant. We can see the worker machine would be fault tolerant because he has more than one now. Etcd now says cluster should have an odd number of nodes. A cluster with two etcd nodes is not fault tolerant. So what does this mean? I thought we needed more than one to be fault tolerant. Actually, we need three or an odd number because if both of these etcd nodes are down and they come up, neither of them can elect a leader. Each one is voting for itself and they can't elect in a leader. So they actually need a tiebreaker or an odd number to say, okay, one of you two are the leader, you guys figure it out, whatever, become the leader and take over Kubernetes. Basically how it works. So we need to set at least three nodes. So now we're good. Now you can adjust the roles here if you want, not really important, but you could say, I don't want any to be etcd, it'd be kind of weird. I don't want any to be control plane, also kind of weird. I don't want any to be workers. That means you couldn't deploy any workloads to Kubernetes. We're gonna keep this here for now. And if you wanna play with this and machine pools and break these roles up, you totally could. But I'm gonna say each one has two CPUs. I'm gonna say each one has four gigs of memory. I'm gonna say each one, I'm gonna lower the disk a little bit down to 20 gigs each. And then we're gonna set a namespace. And so this is a Kubernetes namespace. Most likely you're gonna choose default for those. And default is the default namespace if you don't specify one. Next, we're gonna pick an image. We're not gonna pick Windows for Kubernetes. We're gonna pick the Ubuntu minimal cloud image. So this is a really, really tiny image of Ubuntu uh, dedicated for cloud installations. 
So I'm gonna pick this over the typical Ubuntu. Next, we're gonna choose our network name, and this is why I set up networks and VLANs ahead of time. I'm setting this to my VLAN 30, my untrusted network. Next, we can set up an SSH user like Ubuntu. I'm not really gonna use this, but if you were, you could set it up there. Next, we have security options, which I typically don't touch, but whether or not we wanna encrypt secrets, project network isolation, which I typically don't choose, and then SE Linux, which is some additional security on top of Linux that I'm not really familiar with. And since it's not checked by default, I'm not gonna check it. Truth be told, I don't fully understand it. If you know, let me know in the comments below. And then system services. So you might recognize some of these if you run K3S. So you can choose whether or not you want to include core DNS. You probably want it for DNS. Clipper service LB. Now you may or may not want Clipper as your load balancer. Sometimes people take it out if they're going to run Metal LB along with Rancher inside, but we're not gonna do any of that, but just know that it's here. Traffic ingress, if you don't know about traffic, you don't really know me, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but traffic's a reverse proxy, it's also a network load balancer, it can do tons of things, but you can choose whether or not to include it. And it comes with K3S already, so I'm just gonna leave that checked. Local storage, this is actually your persistent volume claims. So if you wanna bind to local storage, you would set that here. If you're gonna use Longhorn down the road, you could uncheck this. And metric server, most likely you're going to want this if you're gonna do any monitoring or metrics so that you can actually scrape those metrics and stick them somewhere else and look at them later. But if you don't plan on doing any of that, you can uncheck it if you like. Then we have lots of other advanced configurations that I never touch. If you need to do something very specific, just know that it's here. Almost all of these map to a flag within K3S or within another Kubernetes installation that you could toggle on or toggle off. So that aside, let's actually click Create. And while that's going, I'm gonna open these up side by side so we can see what's going on. So on the left side, we have Rancher in this cluster management. And on the right side, we actually have Harvester itself. I guess it could have opened another tab. But we can see that Rancher now on the left is provisioning our new K3S cluster. And on the right side, Harvester got those commands and it's starting to spin up virtual machines for us. So these virtual machines are being created right now automatically. <laughs> one's already running and another one's running and another one's running. So these are all spinning up right now and being created. And while this is going, let's actually peek behind the curtain on this node and see all of the events. So if we look at the provisioning log, we can see a little bit more of what's going on. But these machines right now are being spun up. Ubuntu is getting installed then it's gonna install K3S, then it's going to create a high availability cluster and have Kubernetes running for us. So let's watch this. So now we can see one machine is already running and the other ones are going to check into it. So I already have one machine running in 2.6 minutes, pretty good. If I had some faster, better hardware, this would go a lot faster, but this is pretty fast. So far, two machines in 2.8 minutes already running Kubernetes, now waiting on the third machine. And here we go, three and a half minutes and we have a high availability K3S cluster built on etcd with Harvester. So awesome, so awesome. But let's check on it. Let's not only trust, but let's verify too that it's actually working. So we go into clusters now, we can actually see we have this K3S cluster here. So let's go to cluster management. Let's go full screen. We can see our K3S home cluster, pretty awesome. So pretty awesome, our cluster's up and running. Can we kube control into it? Yeah, let's kube control into it. Let's exec into it and run kube control, do a get all. We can see our cluster is there. Do a get nodes, see all of our nodes. If we do a get all pods, all namespaces, we can see all of our pods running, so awesome. So let's deploy something to this Kubernetes cluster and just make sure it's working. So I typically do it in kube control, but I'll do it through the UI. So let's go into our cluster, go into workloads. Let's create a workload, oh nice. This is a little bit different, but we have a wizard. We wanna create a deployment. Let's name this Nginx. Let's say our replicas are, let's go crazy. Let's say five. We can name this container. We can keep it as is. Let's say Nginx and let's go with Alpine because we want it to be tiny. And we can configure a ton of other stuff, but let's actually create this deployment just to make sure we can deploy workloads to this Kubernetes cluster. So we'll click create, spinning up, it's updating. And just like that, we have five Kubernetes pods running. And we can see these are running on different nodes. So two are running on this node, 
two are running on this node and one's running on another node. So all three nodes are up and running. So really cool, and I know this video is probably getting long, but this is where it gets even cooler. So let's say we wanted to increase the nodes in my cluster. So let's go to cluster management. And now if we edit this cluster, we should have some additional config. Now, if we edit a cluster normally, we don't get this type of config. But because this was provisioned with a node driver and on Harvester, we can make modifications to it. But let's say we wanted two more machines and we'll save it. Now, if we go back into virtualization management, we go into this virtual cluster and we go into virtual machines, we see two more now spinning up. Super awesome. And another thing that's really awesome, we could actually change the configuration of all of these machines. Let's say we wanted to increase the memory to eight gigs on all of these machines and resize the disk to 40 gigs on these machines and give each one two more CPUs with a total of four. Now, the cool thing is it's not just gonna hard shut down all five of these machines, bring them all back up after it reconfigures them. It's actually going to cordon each of these virtual machines and cordon those pods on that virtual machine and then drain that virtual machine of the pods and then actually drain that virtual machine of the cluster, build a new one, bring it back up, add it to the Kubernetes cluster, and then allow pods to be scheduled on it again. And it will do this gracefully for every single machine. I did it last night, take some time, but if you wanna give it a shot, you totally should. And you can see how awesome it is to be able to coordinate virtual machines and shutdowns just by scaling them up like this. To me, this is pretty interesting. At first, when I heard about virtual machines inside of Kubernetes, I thought it sounds kind of crazy. But then I started thinking of the use case for this, doing stuff on the edge. Now, most people running a home lab are on the edge already. We're on the edge of the network. One hop to get on the internet. And we don't have things tucked away in some data center. Besides some people on our Discord server. Just kidding, just kidding. You should totally join if you're not there. But for large corporations, usually getting on the edge is, is kind of hard. So where would you apply this? I started thinking about that. And then I started thinking about remote sites. Remote sites are usually pretty close to the edge. And if you had a remote site that needed both virtualization and cloud-native Kubernetes, you could deploy one of these harvester clusters to a remote site, spin up your virtualization for some of your legacy applications that can't be containerized, and also spin up a Kubernetes cluster at that remote site. That's kind of when the light bulb went on. Now, I don't think that this is made to go and replace your hypervisor. You could if you wanted. But I think its primary use case is to bring HCI plus cloud native to the edge, just as they say this product is for. And so today, going through creating a harvester cluster, creating virtual machines, creating networks for those virtual machines, and looking at the monitoring and metrics to then give us a single plane of glass to manage both Kubernetes and virtual machines, and then deploy Kubernetes on top of those virtual machines is pretty powerful. So what do you think of Harvester? Are you as excited about it as I am? Probably not. Do you see yourself running this anywhere? Let me know in the comment section below. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm in this discovery planning exploratory phase, uh, which is my version of chilling, and I'm working on something that's back there. I had to rip a server out of my rack to put it up here to work on it. So uh, working on something pretty cool, pretty pretty interesting. I'll, I'll say it's interesting to say the least. Uh, it kind of flips uh, a lot of things upside down with, with my architecture. Not sure if it's going to stay, uh, but I'm exploring it and having fun with it so far because it's super interesting.